I just love the way that your voice changed when you talked about how much you loved it. (laughs) That really means something. It definitely does. Uh, I think about that book often. Hey, readers, I'm Ann Bogle, and this is What Should I Read Next, episode 243. Welcome to the show that's dedicated to answering the question that plagues every reader. What should I read next? We don't get bossy on the show. What we will do here is give you the information you need to choose your next read. Every week, we'll talk all things books and reading and do a little literary matchmaking with one guest. Today, I'm chatting with Charlandra Jenkins, a Florida reader who is on the hunt for stories that reflect her life, love, grief, and humanity back to her. For Charlandra, new book releases and recent bestsellers by Black authors are a joy, but she's also yearning for some history. Backlist titles by women of color that say, hey, we've always been here. We've always existed. So my task is to recommend three backlist titles suited to Charlandra's taste for complex, fully realized female characters. And I love the way she describes them finding their way through life and finding themselves along the way. We discuss Charlandra's recent breathtaking reads and her enduring love for Zora Neale Hurston. We're digging deep into novels that carry the reader through grief, Southern literature, classics you might not have heard about in school, and you'll definitely want to hear about the book Charlandra expects will become a classic of our time. Let's get to it. Charlandra, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Oh, it is my pleasure. We were so excited (laughs) to get your submission at What Should I Read Next HQ, and I'm really excited about talking books with you today. This is a dream, so thank you so much. Well, something that was very clear in your submission is you've thought a lot about your reading life. You know, you know what you enjoy. You know what you're looking for. How would you describe your experience as a reader? It's funny because I actually, my parents were in the military. We moved around a lot. So I had a lot of like different experiences and access to different people. And then as I moved into a smaller town, my mom's hometown in Ocala, Florida, um, my experiences were definitely different. And it was a different world being in like central Florida and having read as a child, a lot of books that kind of center maleness, whiteness, European centric experiences as an adult, it's been really important for me to read experiences that mirror more of what my life experience has been. And I think I was in high school and I read Their Eyes Were Watching God and reading Zora Neale Hurston and seeing actually in print my little town, Ocala, Florida, making it into the book. It was like magical for me. And so as an adult, I've decided that I want to read more books by women who not only just look like me, but have an experience similar to mine. And and it's just been really important for me to read about those women, about myself. And I glean so much insight into my own interior world. I love complicated women. Tell me more about your relationship with Zora Neale Hurston. I read that book and to see this woman trying to navigate a world that I was familiar with, that a world that I was currently living in, her characters felt so real to me. They felt like people that I knew the way that they spoke. And Zora and Neil Hurston herself just had such an interesting life. You know, at one point she decided that she was just going to rewrite the rules for herself and just cut a 10 smooth years off of her age and decided to re-enroll herself to school. (laughs) She was a pioneer. She was an anthropologist. She was a folklorist. She was interested in canonizing Southern Black literature and centering women in that in a way that's been so important to understand because my history, my family, family history, I have very little information about where I came from because of the nature of slavery in this country. And so to read something that potentially like my great grandparents, my grandparents could recognize that feels a part of their world is just so important to me. It's really been like a mirror into a part of myself that like I knew was there, but I hadn't fully realized. 
I love that you use that word. I was just thinking of my conversation with Lamar Giles, a wonderful episode of the podcast. Please go back and listen if you haven't, listeners. But he talks about the importance of having books that are windows and books that are mirrors. And I love Zora as well. But she's a window for me. It's so good to hear that you connected with her as a mirror. And I love that you connected with her so deeply, even though there are many decades between your existence in Florida, even though you were very close to each other geographically. I'm dying to know, have you read her new but very old collection, Hitting a Straight Lick with a Crooked Stick? No, it's in my queue. I have not read that yet, but I actually just finished Barracoon, which was incredible. And that was about the last slave uh, who was brought over from Africa illegally And then he was enslaved for a period of time and then freed and his experiences from Africa to the ship to America. And uh, it reduced me to tears. And there was just so much power in that account. Now, you are definitely the Zora expert in the room here. But my understanding is that (laughs) Barracoon is quite different from her other books. It's more anthropological, isn't it? Yeah, it's an interview. There's not really any novelization there. It's just a direct account from his time in Africa to his time in America. It's really a window into his life. But also, I mean, she was very politically oriented. She actually did a, there was a a murder in Florida that she actually did a lot of work with a newspaper to explain the accounts that were happening. And it was about a a black woman who had murdered a very rich white man who was believed to be her lover. She really wanted to canonize what black people, black folks were going through during this history and time. She knew the importance of canonizing that narrative, canonizing our experiences. I asked if you had read Hitting a Straight Lick with a Crooked Stick because I just finished listening to it in the past month, so it's fresh in my mind. And something that I really appreciated about it is that this edition, it was edited by Genevieve West and Tayari Jones does the foreword. These two women say so much about Zora's work as a whole and then what's specific about this collection but I laughed when she you said she shaved 10 years off her age not because (laughs) not because it doesn't sound bold and preposterous which it does but because they talked about that at length in the intro to this text and so it said so much about her personal history and I knew a little bit about her professional history, you know, her education Mm -hmm. and how important she was in the literary community in Harlem during a really crucial time. But I didn't know as much about her personally. And I so appreciated that they did not skimp on her personal history. (laughs) I will read anything Tiari Jones writes about anyone. Yes. But I really love that aspect. And for listeners who don't know, hitting a straight lick with a crooked stick, one of the early things in the book is, here's what that title means. And here's how it fits so smoothly into the language for which Zora Neale Hurston was so well known. But it's a collection of old Zora Neale Hurston stories that were just recently found because they were published in periodicals and archives and newspapers and magazines that people were reading in, you know, the 20s and the 30s. But they're not names that we think of now. And so people have just stumbled upon these physical papers and sometimes microfiche. And we get new Zora Neale Hurston stories almost 100 years later. So I'm excited that that's on your to be read list. I think you're going to like it. I'm so excited to pick it up. Okay, so we know you love Zora. She's an author that's been really important to you. What other authors or experiences have been really formative in your reading life? I love Bell Hooks. She's been incredibly important to me. She's so prolific. I love the idea that she's just like, as a woman, you should write, Um, which is something I'm trying to get a better handle on for myself. But she's been a huge figure. And I just, I recently kind of got on this tear. Uh, I think I want to blame like Haley Butler's uh, The New Me um, about like these really just complicated wayward women who I just love the idea. It's not like this woman who has it all and who has figured it all out it's it's something that I can relate to more so (laughs) someone who's like desperately trying to figure it out and making mistakes and just learning and it's not pretty it's it's real life and I think one of the adjectives that come up a lot is like kind of grotesque and that sounds kind of gross but to me that just means we're not shying away from realities there's this idea that women are supposed to be 
very strong and we have it all and we uh, move forward in the world in a way. Take no um, prisoners or the damsel in distress. And I feel like what's more powerful is like the nuance in between about a woman who perhaps wants a relationship, but also feels like motivated to do her own thing, but doesn't really know herself well and is trying to figure out. Those are some of the experiences that I do relate to and that I do see in the page when I read someone like Haley Butler or Sorry to Disturb the Peace. Yeah just really complicated women who are trying to make the best of it. I choose the books that I do because it does give me that mirror. Like I do need to know that I'm not alone, especially during like these difficult COVID times. Like isolation is real and my books are a constant companion. Well, Charlandra, I can't wait to hear what you chose and how we're going to see wayward, complicated, and uh, your word, grotesque women. <laughs> I'm excited to dive in. So you know how this works. You're going to tell me three books you love, one book you don't, and what you've been reading lately. And we'll talk about you, what you may enjoy reading next. How did you choose these? Um, it was really hard. I had to choose books that I think I had the strongest reactions to, but also like have managed to linger in my mind after reading other books. And I'm still like redirecting myself to these books and thinking about them. Actually, We Cast a Shadow I had started it maybe last year and it hit way too close to home initially. It's about a black man in a post-racialized South. And I'm using air quotes when I say post-racialized. And he works for a law firm. There can only be one person in this crop of associates. It's into partnership. And he believes that he needs to become a partner in order to get his biracial son a surgery that will render him white passing and just all of the elements of work culture and professionalism while being black it's just at first it feels so over the top in terms of its satire but it's so grounded in realism and the real life complexities of being black in america today i mean i feel strongly that a book should be read in schools i believe it's a new classic i think it's incredible I know it's been long listed for literary awards and I'm looking forward to reading it, but I haven't yet. It's a lot to take in and it, it kind of feels farcical at times, but there's a part in the book that's, I just laughed, but also like wanted to like curl up on a ball and cry where he's describing his workplace and there is a diversity committee at his job that literally is only held by white people and they all have able body privilege and they're all heteronormative. So it's like, it's just like, it's just a lot to take in and it's an incredible book. I strongly recommend. So that is We Cast a Shadow by Maurice Carlos Ruffin. Yes. I'm just stopping to notice that you had this experience of reading a book and you thought, oh, everyone should read this. This should be taught. Like this is mm -hmm. important enough and potentially formative enough that you want to see young people and people really studying literature have this experience. Absolutely. I think that it's so important because I think that there's someone in your show, I forgot what episode it was, but someone mentioned the difference between fiction and nonfiction about the fact that like fiction really tells us who we are. Nonfiction tells us like what it is, but fiction tells us who we are. And like, I believe that sometimes we can really be taught more about a person's humanity in fiction than we can from nonfiction. Because we are living a life of nonfiction every day. Like, this is real life. But there's something about novelizing those universal principles that people really can take in and absorb in a way that perhaps can be drowned out by everyday experiences. It gets us out of our bubble. Charlandra, what did you choose for your second book? My second book was uh, My Year of Rest and Relaxation. I would say that this, this aligns with my grotesque, complicated uh -huh. female niche about this woman who is just having a tough go at it. She is in a job that she doesn't really care much for. She's in an awful relationship, which is not something that I'm currently in. I just want to be very clear about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's in a relationship that's not servicing her needs, and it's a difficult time. And she's decided that 
she is going to opt out of life for a little bit and drink and take pills for the next year in order to like numb herself. And I know that sounds really depressing, but it's actually, I don't know. There's something about this book that I just come back to over and over again and how this book along with like severance really reminded me like we can become untethered by grief and how we respond to grief it's so key and I just saw a lot of myself oh that's such a lovely way to put it it's a great window into just how hard it is to sometimes get through life and it doesn't hold anything back when did you read this book I want to say late last year. I'm not going to lie. It's probably a little darker than what I would probably choose to pick up right about now. But I read this last year when shortly beforehand, my, my grandfather passed away. So I saw a lot of myself in this person who was, who was grieving. I imagine that changed the way you connected with what Otessa Moshevig was writing. Yeah, absolutely. It just feels bad being out there in the world with nothing to keep you grounded and in place. I feel that I connect with that deeply. That sounds really powerful. So um, I guess my third pick, my third book would be Severance, which I just mentioned again, which is a book I read pre COVID. And so you can imagine that now it's something that I revisit in my mind constantly. And, but that's also a book beyond just like, a book about a pandemic. That's a book about being untethered by grief in a way where you are lost and you're trying to look for things. And I think that author did so many great little touches. There's a part where she gets connected to a group of people who are taking care of themselves. First, for those who haven't read Severance, let's talk about viruses for a moment. (laughs) Yeah. So the book is about a young woman who is working in a listless job, but there becomes a virus that originates in China and quickly spreads across the globe. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with that (laughs) idea. And this was written, I think, in 2018 or published in 2018. I read it last year. Do you want to hear something truly terrible? Uh, I just came across a review of this recently in a list of coronavirus novels. And I was looking at something from The New Yorker in 2018. And it said, Ling Ma's severance captures the bleak, fatalistic mood of 2018. And I thought, oh, you just had no idea. (laughs) No idea. It's true. If you if you thought that was bleak and fatalistic, wait to wait till you meet 2020. Uh, you just see the way that she's trying to go out and figure herself out in the world. And yes, there's this pandemic, but she's also grieving the loss of a family member mm-hmm. and trying to figure out her space. And so I just so relate to that. And I just I just love the book so much. It's just it's more than about the pandemic. And I know the ending is very um, divisive. People either love it or hate it. I personally loved it. Well, either way, any divisive ending that you love or hate makes for excellent book club discussion. So if anybody listening is in charge of selecting something for book club, that's always a good sign. I just love the way that your voice changed when you talked about how much you loved it. (laughs) That really means something. Yes, yes, it it definitely does. Uh, I think about that book often. I love that you use the word linger when you described how you chose these books. Yeah, I mean, like, I like to think like a good book, like changes something in me. It makes me think about something a little bit differently. Charlandra, how did you choose the book that was not for you? I chose a book that actually I read for my book club and that was more complicated than just like love or hate. I don't have a problem with saying I hate a book at all, but I chose this book because I do think there are some great parts of this book on merit, but then there's some really troubling things that I, that I feel like it's important to call out. What's the book? So I chose Where the Crawdads Sing because I love um, nature writing. I'm familiar with Marjorie Kenan Rawlings and Marjorie uh, Stoneman Douglas. I'm from Florida. I love things that center like nature and when like the environment becomes an important character in a novel. And reading it, I just love the way she described things. But the reason why I put it as something that I didn't care for or like was because this book is set in a, in a certain time where Black people were segregated 
but also there was cruel, cruel injustice. And I felt that the way that she wrote her black characters were very much just in service to the white narrator. And in one particular scene, unfortunately, the author chose to degrade one of her black characters. There's a scene where there's two white kids who are taunting one of the black characters and they call him the n-word which is one of the cruelest ways to dehumanize a person the white character saves the day by kind of sneakily throwing things just to spook them out and leave him alone and i think the author wanted to show that the white narrator has grown close to this person because she's an outsider for one reason and he's an outsider for another reason like look these two outsiders have managed to forge a relationship, but I do think there's something that diminishes his humanity in order to show that they were close, that cheapened the novel in general. And then they also describe, the black character's name is Jumpin, the way that Jump, they describe Jumpin's wife was very much overemphasis on her physique. They manified the wife. And so I was very disappointed by those things. It was troubling. And that's why I think it's important for communities that are marginalized it's really important for them to write their stories and it's also important for the publishing industry when they see things like this to kind of call it out and make sure they have people in place and diversity is important in publishing as well I was just so dumbfounded like why didn't that editor see that for what it was and say hey this doesn't actually move the story forward this doesn't actually service these characters these characters have no agency um let's do something a little bit different in order to like have a more well-rounded nuanced character development for these people and so that's where I felt the book lacked. I've not read this one, which uh, somehow I feel like I've been saying a lot on what should I read next lately. I guess readers are bringing it up for all kinds of reasons, but I can really relate to the experience of reading a book and loving certain parts of it, but feeling like, ugh, this had such potential to become an amazing read. Yeah, because it's not as if I don't want the book to exist. All of the nature writing and the beautiful love story to me was diminished by the lack of humanity that the author had for the black characters. I'm not a sidekick in my own life. I I am the main character in my own life and I want to feel that and have that experience when I read a book. I love the way you put that. We're going to keep that in mind when we pick books for you today. Oh, yes. Charlandra, what have you been reading lately? I recently read uh, Real Life by Brandon Taylor, and Mm -hmm. uh, that was incredible. I've heard wonderful things. Oh, wow. That was just so beautiful about a young gay black man in biology field trying to find his way in life. Uh, I also just read Nella Larson's Passing, which is incredible. I did, had no idea that she existed. She wrote during the Harlem Renaissance. I feel like she's a lesser name. We hear our, our Langston Hughes and our Zora Neale Hurston's, but Nella Larson was someone that I had not heard of until this year. And so reading Passing and being prepared to uh, read Britt Bennett's new book, The Vanishing Half, it set me on the right course. And so I'm actually in the middle of Britt Bennett's book, The Vanishing Half. I loved the mothers and I loved that it was a complicated female relationship between friends and so now I'm interested in like this idea of passing and also it being within the same family of twin sisters and I'm enjoying it so far it's incredible it's been so deeply satisfying to see that book really catching fire on the internet speaking about the vanishing half now I loved it so much it's already become a book that I can't stop talking about on what should I read next since I read it back in the spring and I'm so glad that you're reading it and enjoying it Tell me more about Passing. This is a book that I also just read this year for the first time, and it was not at all what I expected. I can't believe, (laughs) I can't believe it took me till now to read it. I I thought I knew what it was about, and it was, but there was so much more to the story. I had no idea. So much more. What was your experience like? I thought that the writing was incredibly fresh for it to have been written so long ago. It was like 1925, 26, something like that. Exactly. And so you have like this relationship between these two women who used to know each other growing up, but one of the women decides to pass for white, but her passing for white has left her alienated within her own home, her community further. And so she finds herself wanting to like be a part of the black community that she 
removed herself from and the dangers of that. And, oh, you just see these two women kind of competing and going at it. And I really feel like it was almost like I was watching like a Black Downton Abbey. There's like this master of wits situation going on. I just loved it so much. And it was so surprising. And it's it's fairly short, so it, you can read it very, very quickly. But I just thought it was so fresh and so unexpected. Yeah. Readers, if you've been thinking about picking this one up, it's such a fast read. It's not long. If you want to hang on a little bit, there's a new beautiful edition coming out, I think early this fall. Oh, wow. Your library is likely to have it. Maybe you can download it today and finish before dinner. Yes. I mean, I got it through my library and uh, I just, it's a psychological thriller, which I had never read from that particular perspective and that date and time. So that's why that really was the thing that caught fire for me about like backlist titles. Because I imagine you're thinking something like, okay, this book was written almost 100 years ago. I'm just reading it now. It blew me away. What else am I missing? Exactly. It's like, oh, I had no idea this person existed. And now what else do I not know about? I need to know all the things now. (laughs) I love Bookstagram. Bookstagram gives me lots of great books that are about to come out, but I know there's books that I have not heard of and I want to read about women, about marginalized groups, about, you know, non-binary folks. I want to read about those experiences. I I want to read about marginalized communities from people who are in those communities. And I know there's a backlist. We've always existed, right? I know it's not a new thing that all of these books are coming out. I want to explore what has already been put out there. In some ways, I feel like, oh, I can't believe it's been here all this time. And I just didn't know. But on the positive side, it opens up this whole world of possibility. Exactly. Makes me so excited for my recommendations. (laughs) No pressure. (laughs) Okay. You loved We Cast a Shadow by Maurice Carlos Ruffin. My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Otessa Mosfeg and Severance by Ling Ma. I just got to repeat that you said that you love stories about complicated women. Not For You was Where the Credits Sing by Delia Owens. And we're looking for more backlist titles by women, those in marginalized communities, and if the stories are told by those voices out of that experience, so much the better, yes? Yes. I'm excited. Me too. Although always a little bit terrified right here. (laughs) Okay. So you said you loved passing in part because it was a psychological thriller. Yeah. And that makes me wonder if you have ever read The Street by Anne Petrie. No. Do you know? Tell me more. No, no. I've never heard of that. Oh, I'm so excited. Oh, that is music to my ears. This book was published in 1946. It sold a staggering number of copies like one and a half million, something like that. It was incredibly popular in its day. And then we all forgot about it. Actually, I have a little theme in my reading life lately. I keep reading works that have been introduced by Tiari Jones. So ah, uh. this is totally coincidence, but I am, I am here for it. I like this trend. I would like to invite the universe to keep sending Tiari Jones texts my way. <laughs> I'm good with that. But she wrote this excellent introduction to the version of the street I read in which she talks about her personal experience with the book. But in part, she's taking stock of the literary landscape as she sees it today and asks, why do so few people read Anne Petrie today? Mm. I have no idea. I wouldn't call this a psychological thriller, but it is a literary thriller. And it does two things that you don't often see together, but that I really love put together. You can tell me how this sounds. It's a literary novel, beautiful prose, carefully crafted. You're in the hands of a skilled wordsmith who wants beautiful language. But there is plot, like pulling you through the story. So you can call this a literary thriller. I like to call the genre compulsively readable literary fiction (laughs) based on some of your favorites. This could work for you. But let me tell you more about the story. Yeah. At the time she wrote it in 1946, this was contemporary fiction. And she explicitly wanted to address the issues of the day, which were, as she saw it, race and gender and poverty. Sadly, those are the issues of our day as well. That much has not changed. The way it looks is a little different. But the heroine here, her name is Ludie Johnson. And she's a single mother who lives in Harlem with her eight-year-old son. She's married. She married the man she fell in love with. And 
thought they were going to live happily forever in Harlem, but, but the marriage falls apart. And what she shows is the choices Ludie Johnson makes. And it makes you think like, what, what could this poor woman have done differently to make things end up better? Mm. Her husband can't get a job. Peter is very explicit in the text that he can't get hired because he's black. No one wants to hire him because he's black. It's a problem. They don't have any income. It destroys their relationship. It destroys his self-esteem. What Ludie Johnson does is she sees an ad for a family in Connecticut that needs a nanny, basically. So she leaves her own son at home to go to Connecticut for 27 days out of the 31 in a month. She doesn't want to come back weekly because then she'd have to pay the train fare. And she's trying to save as much money as she can so the family can be together again because eventually, surely, her husband will get a job. Except he doesn't. I don't know if we'd call it a spoiler, but I'm not going to tell you what happens when she's in Connecticut. But it's not good. The family she's with in Connecticut is really kind to her most of the time. But she sees and experiences racism in that community and the way they talk about their help that causes her to reflect on the page for the reader about what it means to be black and why they view her the way they do and how that's different than the way she views them. And she reflects a lot on economics. And she's learned something about Ben Franklin, how he believed you can make something of yourself. You just need the will. You just need to read. You just need the smarts. You just need the drive. And she she believes in that version of the American dream that she can do that. But as she moves back to Harlem and she tries to put these deep-seated beliefs that she can make something of her life, this specific kind of vision that she has that she wants to realize in her life and for her son, as she tries to bring that into being, you see through every day she's living out on the page, everything she's facing and things that seem promising. Turns out the people offering them had completely different ideas in mind than she did as to what they'd each get out of the deal. And oh, it's just gutting, but wow. in a really thought provoking page turning way. I want to tell you a little bit about what Tiari Jones said in the introduction. Yes. And she said a funny thing. She read this book as a signed reading back at Spelman when she went there as, I believe, an undergraduate, but she she was a student. She said she bought her copy from the bookstore and the cover art was dignified. It was a black and white photograph. And she said it was radioing to the students. This is an important book with serious themes. But her classmate got the book someplace else. It was an old copy that she'd um, taken from her mother's bookshelf. And in this copy, Ludie, the heroine, is uh, wearing a corset and a red dress. And she's got this hairdo (laughs) and the tagline on the front, which wasn't written for students and scholars. It was written for the people who bought 1.5 million copies of this book. Sex and violence on the mean streets of Harlem. And Tiari Jones said, now, come on, this, I would have actually wanted to read that book. Like everybody should have seen that cover. You can Google them and see the differences. It's really interesting. Oh, wow. But that is The Street by Anne Petrie, 1946. It's been reissued recently. And so the hope is that we'll see a resurgence in readership. How does that sound? Do you think you might be one of those readers? Oh, that sounds incredible. Was, I, when you were describing it, it reminded me a lot of Behold the Dreamers. Yeah. And I enjoyed that a lot. So I'd be interested in reading something like that. Plus, I mean, I enjoyed American Marriage so much. Another complicated woman. So yeah, I definitely would would like to check that out. Okay. The next one I have in mind is from 1982. It's Gloria Naylor's The Women of Brewster Place. Yeah, Is this a title you're familiar with? I have actually never read it, but I've seen the movie so many times. Are we talking about the miniseries that Oprah made? Yes. What did you think? Oh my gosh. It's because I haven't seen the miniseries. Oh wow. I feel like I feel like it's just like one of those movies that like was always on in the background when I was a kid and I've watched it so many times, but I haven't seen it recently. You know what? It never occurred to me to like pick up the book. I've actually never read any Gloria Naylor, so and her name has been popping up quite a bit. So I'm excited. Oh, I'm glad to hear this. She went on to write plenty of other books, but this is her debut, published in 1982. It actually won the National Book Award as a first novel in 1983. And this is one of those books that critics and readers both loved, which we know that's not always the same thing. (laughs) So you've seen the TV version. For the novel, I don't know if you'll be surprised to hear or not that this is a novel in short stories. It's a kaleidoscope. So the whole book is set in a housing development in an unnamed city which was founded by people with insidious goals. And it's just got this um, aura of corruption about it. 
it's seven short stories overall, but the first six stories, each one focuses on an individual resident who lives in the development. And what's unique about the short stories is that they each have their own arc. You get the whole picture when you put them together, but each short story has its own character development. And the final story focuses on the community as a whole. So what I like about this for you is that it covers a wide range of Black women's experiences featuring women of different classes, different backgrounds, different geographical origins, different sexual orientations, different generations. And something Gloria Naylor does really, really well is move the reader through time. I mean, just in the span of a few paragraphs, you can cover 80 years in somebody's life and family history. All the residents are there for different reasons, which is interesting. And you see, again, a wide variety of motives, their reasons for being. There's only one of the six residents who's in this housing development by choice, and that's interesting, too. There's the story of Lorraine and Teresa, who are the only lesbian residents at Brewster Place. Yes. I think something that's really unique about a book like this is you get the personal glimpse of someone's history yeah. many times over because the way the novel is structured. You know the story. How does the book version sound to you now? The book version sounds really great. You know, it's interesting you said that about like the different backgrounds of the women themselves, like being different. And like, I think that's important to me in terms of like blackness isn't a monolith, right? The experiences of that lesbian couple juxtaposed to the experiences of like the heterosexual women in that community are going to vary. And those nuances are important and Ah, oh, that's that's a really that's a really great pick. I'm really excited about that one. I'm excited you're excited. Charlandra, I did not see us talking about this book today. But how do you feel about nonfiction? I love nonfiction. The book I have in mind, in part because you've talked about how you love nature writing several times, is Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Do you know this one? I literally last night just put this on my TBR. What? What happened that you put it on your TBR last night? Oh my gosh, I don't even remember. I, I've just been doing more research about nature writing and trying to find more Black or Indigenous authors in that realm, and this came up. Yes, because Kimmerer is a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. Well, here, let me tell you the subtitle of the book. It's Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants. This book was first put on my radar a hundred or so episodes ago when Ashley Gossens chose it as her favorite in episode 163. And listeners, if you want to listen to her talk about it, that episode is called Wonderful, Wonder-Filled Reading in the Great Outdoors. I was just talking to a friend recently about what she's reading now, because that's what I often talk about when I see friends. <laughs> I said, what are you reading? And she said that she had had a conversation with her therapist about how she was having a hard time being a person in the world right now. It's just there's so, so much happening. And I was surprised to hear that her therapist recommended she read this book. My friend is a gardener. That's what she does professionally. So maybe that's part of it. But the more I thought about it, the more I like the idea of people reading Robin Wall Kimmer right now. Because what she does in this nonfiction book is weave together disparate elements to make a story that perhaps you didn't know you wanted, that I didn't know I wanted. She's a biology professor. Um, she's a Potnawatami woman. She's a mother. She's a writer. And she's someone who has a deep and abiding appreciation and respect for nature. And what she does is, I think, shows you how to see the world in a way that you just never thought to see it. Especially, she's, she's looking at something that we're all familiar with, the natural world, but she's calling you to see it in a whole new way. This is important anytime and also right now because she's calling us to see how we're all in this together. She talks from her heritage about how we need a culture of regenerative reciprocity instead of one that just diminishes everybody yes. or gives the few a lot at the expense of the many who have nothing left. She's calling us to a better way to live. And what it reminds me of is um, I'm in Kentucky I love Wendell Berry. <laughs> He's said in interviews for years, like, if the economy we have does this to people and this to the land, we need a new economy. Yes. So that stuck with me because he's the first one I heard articulate that thought in that way. And Robin Wall Kimmerer makes a similar argument in her own 
beautiful, eloquent, really compelling way. She's talking about how we need an economy. And when she says economy, we're not just talking about changing money. We're talking about ways of living in the world with other people. We need an economy that is aligned with life, not stacked against it. And she says that it's easy to write that. It's harder to do. But the first step is to envision what it could be like. And just, she's so imaginative and her writing is so evocative. Oh, wow. I just think you might really like it. And let me tell you about the braiding sweetgrass. Yes. In order to literally weave a braid of sweetgrass, there has to be someone on the other end of your strands holding them taut. And that's the analogy underlying the book. What do you think, Charlandra? How does that sound to you? I'm like floored by that recommendation because I'm reading actually Working the Roots. I don't know that one. Yeah, it's with Michelle Lee and it's about traditional African-American healing, but that also coupled with the indigenous peoples who African-Americans learned like healing methods, but also the methods that they that they had in Africa really brought to the States, coupled with the indigenous peoples. And I love botany. I love plants. And so, oh, wow, I'm really excited that this is a recommendation. I love what you said about the generous reciprocity. What was it? Yeah, the generous reciprocity. That's it. I love that. I'm so excited. I'm excited that you're excited. And I mean, you know it's a good sign if you just put it on your TBR last night and then it comes up again. Yes. I saw it very quickly. I was just, I was doing very cursory research about things I want to read next. And I did, but I hadn't really fully delved in as to what it was. So that just further bolsters that it needs to, it, that it should be in my TBR. I'm happy to hear it. Okay, you know we're going chronological order. So we've been from 1946 to 82 to 2013. How do you feel about graphic novels? I'm very open to them. Okay, we got to do one more. Yes. The one I have in mind is recent. It's from 2018. This would not be backlist, but it's called Bingo Love. It's by T. Franklin. Do you know this? No, never heard of it. Oh, that makes me so happy. Our producer, Brenna Frederick, put this on my radar. Longtime listeners know that Brenna is a huge graphic novel fan and also a recommender. I mean, when we get together as a What Should I Read Next team, (laughs) um, we trade book recs. I know no one is shocked by that. (laughs) But T. Franklin is a black, queer, and disabled comic artist. So I know that you're wanting to read Own Voices Perspectives from marginalized writers. So this book... Hard things happen, of course, but it's just so gentle and happy, and it's also so, so beautiful. This is a love story about two girls, Hazel and Mary, who are best friends as children. They meet when they're young in a bingo hall, and something that I really love about this story is the way these gorgeous drawings really bring that to life. The colors are really saturated and vibrant, and you can see, like in the bingo hall, you can see like all the little balls in the bingo machine popper thing. (laughs) They've got their cards and there's mood lighting for different scenes. It's really, it makes for an interesting reading experience. And what I love about a graphic novel is that instead of setting the atmosphere with prose and the turns of phrase, the artist can also do it with the lighting and the look on someone's face and the clothing and the hairstyles. And oh, I just, that's, that's really fun. So Hazel and Mary are best friends, and then they become more than friends. And then, ooh, you know what I should have told you, is this story starts in the 60s. Oh, oh, wow. So they become more than friends. Someone sees the girls kissing on the sidewalk. And these two rather traditional black families, both the parents lose their minds. And one of the girls ends up getting moved down south for the (sighs) explicit purpose of separating the girls. It's the 60s. We don't do that. Right. There's a lot of talk about sin and shame and how dare you, you know, bring that on the family. And so they're torn mm-hmm. apart and they grow up. They both go on to marry men. Um, one of the girls is told by her father, like, OK, you did your little rebellious stunt thing. Here's James. He's your husband. They grow up. They live their lives. But then in their 60s, when they're grandmas, they meet again in the small town they grew up in. So at its heart, this is very much a love story. Oh. Well, in two parts. So the first time they're in high school, but the second time they're in their 60s. So you have these two, I mean, still completely gorgeous grandmothers with their graying hair meeting again and falling in love and having it go differently that time. And um, the women are beautifully drawn. One of them really loves clothes. 
And so you see that in the illustrations, which is really fun. You love a complicated woman. Oh, yes. Clearly, you enjoy hard themes. And while this book has hard themes, it's just so happy. And I think I think it might be a nice compliment to the books we've gathered here today. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. I could definitely, one, I don't read as many graphic novels as I feel like I should because I know there's some beautiful storytelling that's happening there. So I'm really excited by this medium that I'm not that fluent in. And then also, I love those themes of kind of like the forbidden love, but also the presence of happiness. Like, I like the occasional happy ending. So I think... (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad you said that because I might not have known. I think it's definitely something I can look forward to um, reading. Yeah, for sure. For sure. If you get the jackpot edition of this book, it contains a whole bunch of bonus material. It's something like 60 pages. And that includes a lot of stories by writers as well, like Beverly Johnson, Sean Pryor, Alyssa Cole, Gail Simone. So it is a graphic novel. And yet you can have all this bonus content as well that you may really enjoy. Noted. Wow. I'm Mm -hmm. so excited. Okay. So Charlandra, today we talked about The Street by Anne Petrie, The Women of Brewster Place by Gloria Naylor. Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, and Bingo Love by T. Franklin. Of those titles, what do you think you may be reading next? You know, I will be reading all of these, but I think the next one that I will likely read is, I think it's The Street. That one was really intriguing to me. I think that's going to be my next book. I'm happy to hear it. I can't wait to hear what you think. Just to be very, very, very clear, all of them are getting read. (laughs) And there's not one that doesn't sound incredible. So it's just an issue of which order. And I might just stick to the chronological order idea. Is it weird to say I wouldn't have thought of that myself, even though I very deliberately put them in chronological order for you? (laughs) Well, I'm excited. You're excited. And I'm so glad we got to have this conversation. Thanks for talking books with me today. Thank you so much for having me. This has been incredible. I feel like I've said incredible 20 times, but it it has been. I mean, we're talking about books. I'll take it. (laughs) Hey readers, I hope you enjoyed my discussion with Charlandra today, and I'd love to hear what you think she may enjoy reading next. That page is at whatshouldireadnextpodcast.com slash 243, and it's where you'll find the full list of titles we talked about today. You can follow Charlandra on Instagram at Ranties in Planties. She loves my favorite things, books, and plants, as you will see. Subscribe now so you don't miss next week's episode in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and more. We will see you next week. Readers, thanks so much for being part of our community here. We'd love to connect with you through our newsletter. Sign up for our free weekly delivery at whatshouldireadnextpodcast.com slash newsletter. To support the show in a tangible way, please check out our member community at patreon.com slash whatshouldireadnext, where we share bonus episodes, special highlight reels, and inside peeks on how the podcast happens. We'd love it if you purchased my book, I'd Rather Be Reading, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, or simply tell a friend about our show. Thanks in advance for spreading the book love. Thanks to the people who make the show happen. What Should I Read Next is produced by Brenna Frederick with sound design by Kellen Pekacek. Readers, that's it for this episode. Thanks so much for listening. And as Reiner Maria Rilke said, ah, how good it is to be among people who are reading. Happy reading, everyone.